I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. It's all quite simple. If you can't read, you can't spell, and you won't write, making life an eternal struggle. The Reading Reform Foundation of New York believes good teaching means good learning. That's why they work tirelessly to improve reading instruction by training teachers to teach reading, writing, and spelling in a most successful way. My guests are Sandra Priest Rose, one of the founders, as well as the foundation's chair, the executive director, Lauren Weddles, and Esther Morgan Sands, the education director. So welcome to all of you. Thank you. Sandy, tell us how this started. Ronnie, first of all, we're delighted to be here, I'm and we're renewing a friendship from your days on the city council. But a group of us had gone to a conference in 1979. We were tutors, parents, uh, and teachers. And when we came back to New York, we said, called one another and said, let's start Reading Reform Foundation of New York. And so we began by giving courses. Two years later, in 1981, we incorporated as a not-for-profit organization, which we are to this day. Far more not-for-profit than we wish to be, but we are well, that. So you were at a, at a conference of reading teachers. That's right. But why did you feel it necessary to form a reform reading foundation? Well, we took a name of the uh, national organization, right. which eventually dissolved. But we were united in philosophy, and here we were, six or seven people, all of whom had sought training and found the same uh, principles that worked for us and that we knew worked with children. And by the way, our philosophy of the whole organization is that every child can learn to read regardless of social or economic level. So the, the uh, uniting principles were, one, we all were aware that children needed phonics, they, and adults, by the way, they needed the sound, to learn the sounds of the language and how they are written. And two, that this could be taught in very specific, direct ways. So we believed in direct instruction from a teacher. And three, that if they learned this uh, in a step-by-step -step way, they could conquer the English language and learn its regularities. And the last one was we were all trained individually to teach using multi-sensory system, which is using all the senses, seeing, saying, hearing, using the muscles of the arm to write. And when you're taught that way, it helps imprint learning on the brain easily. So this was a specific philosophy of reading. Is that sort of what it is? I mean, there were two people. Were they neurologists uh, who, who developed the system? Yes. It was based on all of us had yeah. come to this, and Esther is a proponent right. of it, an approach called the Orton-Gillingham approach. And Dr. Orton, O-R-T-O-N, was a neurologist of the 20s, right. 30s, and 40s, and he did this basic research for children with learning problems, but we um, apply it to, to all everybody. children. So Esther, this is, there is not one accepted way of teaching children to learn to read. No, there's a lot of different approaches, but our organization, in our organization, we feel that this approach will reach all children. And that's the difference, because all children need to learn through their eyes, either through their right. eyes, their ears, their, um, with their mouth saying the sounds, and writing those sounds, putting them into words, and then into sentences, reading words and sentences. So we believe that all children will benefit from this approach. And when you say all children, you're meaning cross-income levels and right. different backgrounds that kids come from, even children who are, come from families that are non-English speaking? Right, because we are in many schools today, um, in all parts of the city. Right. In many parts of the city, we have children coming from different countries and um, in, in different kinds of classes. There are bilingual classes, there are dual language classes, there are monolingual classes, and we go into all of them with this approach and what teach I, the teachers. Yeah, you know. What I always find so interesting, because I have a friend who teaches math in a different way, um, 
I, I guess parents must realize that there are all these different techniques, but I'm not sure all parents realize that. So they don't know when they're in a school that's teaching one way that there might be a better way. Is that correct? We have found that low-income parents are ex far more knowledgeable than anyone knows. Many of them remember learning this way in their home countries. Now, I just do want to interject that after we began giving courses in 1981 and so on, two teachers had taken one of our courses and said, you must come into the schools and show us how to apply it in the classroom. Yeah. So around 1985, that's when our major program began of going into the schools and training a teacher directly in her classroom. We have 35 women today, mostly retired teachers, not all, who go in and mentor in the public schools when invited by a principal. And I wish, I'd like Lauren to just explain uh, the process by which a principal can reach us. So Lauren, what happens okay. in school? It, well, it could be the way that Sandy described, which was really the very beginning of the program, when teachers approached us who had taken a course and said, you've taught us so much uh, in this course, is there something more you can do for us in our school? Mm -hmm. So the organization began to formulate what would that look like and how could we assist the teachers in their classrooms. One of the things we have to do, we are, we are guests in a school. So we have to be invited, we visit the principal first, and we tell him or her what we're bringing, which is basically a consultant who's very experienced and well-trained by us. We bring in books, paper, pencils, notebooks, everything that the school might require in the classroom for the teacher to implement this program that they've learned something about through a course. Uh, and the school, in turn, has to agree to identify teachers who will uh, take a course and be willing to participate and devote some time to it, which is basically a consulting period that takes place on their preparation period and a classroom uh, time when they're working with their children and our consultant. So it's a negotiation, a collaboration that begins with a first meeting with a school and a principal, and if they feel that they would like that to happen, we begin this kind of collaboration with them. And it grew from the two teachers that Sandy was describing into now we're in uh, close to 80 classrooms in 25 schools in four boroughs. Uh, sometimes the numbers change, they go up a little or they go down depending upon what schools are requesting our, our services. But it's grown in, in scope, in breadth and depth, and one of the things that differentiates it, we think, is the quality that we bring in. There's a lot of quality control in terms of what Esther does to supervise them and to negotiate all of the relationships that are ongoing through the school year. Once we're in the school and we have a, a schedule that the school and the teachers agree to, we come in, we do our work in a very structured, unobtrusive way, and the principals and the teachers and people in the school just watch things happen in a very effective way. So what grade do you start with? We work in kindergarten, first, second, and third grades, primarily because we want to reach children before they fail, if they're going to fail. We believe in prevention rather than remediation, so we really concentrate on the early grades. So when a teacher is trained, what, how are they trained to teach children to read? Well, one of the things I do want to mention is we only charge 20% of our costs, knocking ourselves out. This is what Lauren helps mm -hmm. with so much, raising the other 80%. The other thing is we think we're the only organization in the United States that goes in 60 times, times. a year. And then you train. We go in twice a week That's all on location year long. in the classroom but then you also train outside of the class. That's right, so they get a 40-hour course uh -huh. and then 120 hours of training. But tell me why these people, ha why teachers haven't been trained earlier? None of us were. We, none of us in our graduate, undergraduate, or even elementary school learned how to analyze English the way we do. So and I'll show just, us what, how, tell I'll, us how you do it. Yes, I just should like to show. For example, we teach this as A in the middle of a word. And then we might teach, now this is first grade, A at the end of a word. 
Without any pain, we have taught children that no English word ends in I. Spaghetti and macaroni are Italian words. And it's a painless, wonderful way to analyze the English language. It's, it, so <laughs> I'm still back. <laughs> the, a teacher becomes a teacher. A teacher has, has an education about becoming a teacher. Right. So, but most of the teachers that come out of the universities, uh, they learn a little bit about everything. So when they get into the classroom, they have to teach children who may not right. know how to read, right. may not know how to write, and probably don't know how to spell. Or, and then they're at a loss because they know a little bit about everything. But really, how to teach the English language is complicated because they have not really delved into the specifics of, for example, teaching the child the sounds of the language. They might not even themselves know the sounds of the, sounds of the language. They might not learn or they might not have known before they walk into the classroom. How do you teach children to blend sounds to perhaps get to the end of the yeah. word? Do, you, do, they all, do they know the alphabet by the time you get to? They, they, um, yes, they, they know the beginning, they know the end. And there's often the middle is, <laughs> but they do know the beginning of the words and they do know the ends of the word, right. of the alphabet. Um, but the teachers, that's who we're really looking at, come to our courses since we give the courses at our office, telling us they're hungry for this information. They don't know how to approach a child. Right. They need to. And when the child stops and falters, they give them the word. You know, they just say, this is, you know, table. Yeah. They don't know how to analyze the word themselves. So how would analyze table for us? Well, we teach them that a vowel, like A, when it's alone in a syllable, like te, says A. But if it's closed, if, it's, if there was a C after it, it would be uh, tac. Uh, so we would teach them the structure, the vowel structure of the language. We would teach them the consonant LE part, which is stable final syllable. And then they would be able to say te, Bull. But the teachers have to know this. I see. And if the teachers don't know how to explain it and how to teach it, they can't explain it to the children. And so we find teachers coming and thanking us, having this aha moment. There's a spelling rule. It's a click. <laughs> yeah, yes, that click. That's, there's a spelling rule? I never knew when you double the final consonant. So. Ronnie, could I show sure. one other thing? Well, Even in first grade, teachers all over America teach the word one, O-N-E, but there's right. no logic to it. But it becomes logical if you teach it with loan, alone, only, then it becomes clear that... I see, you're putting it in context and you're exactly. showing that... And that it once was pronounced. In Chaucerian times, it was owner. And so we're teaching comprehension. To right along with it, uh, roots of words, origins of words. It's wonderful. Uh, in first grade, we might teach the word Sunday, Sunday in syllables. What do you think Sunday is named for? The kids always come up with the sun. Yeah. Teachers don't. They come after school. They're taking a course. They're exhausted. They never say Sunday. <laughs> and then you say to the kids, and what do you think Monday is named for? And of course, it's the moon's mm. day. The kids always. So this, you also enrich the whole teaching. Right. And w the part that I've read about it is that you, you want them to stretch, exactly. to try to add something extra to just learning the word. Mm -hmm. so, yes. So you've got very rich curriculum, I mean, things for them to read. So that the purpose of all this is not just to grunt out sounds, but to read wonderful literature. And in the first grade or second grade, if they can't read it, we read it to them. So we like them to read about Greek, Greek mythology. The Trojan horse is here in a simple version. This is about knights in armor, which is my big love. And we want them to, and also, this is a way of engaging boys. Boys don't really want to read about little cute rabbits. Yeah. They need knights in armor and so on, and so it's fun. And Robin Hood is a winner everywhere. The kids adore it.
And then you, then the teacher, it's, it's up to the teacher, but you're suggesting to the teacher that they round it out with a visit to someplace or seeing something, right? Exactly right. Do you have a curriculum that you give to people as suggestions? Well, we do have a sequence yeah. of um, instruction right. for each grade, first grade, second grade, third grade, and, kin and kindergarten. So we do give that. In the course, we explain the sequence of instruction to the teachers. So, Lauren, I just wanted to make one point. When you say it's twenty, when when um, you say it's twenty dollars, um, it's not up to the teacher to pay. I mean, it's the school that's paying it, isn't it? Twenty percent. Twenty percent. Twenty. It? Twenty percent. Yeah, it's yeah, the, the Department uh, of Education. Yes, when we make an arrangement with the schools, we have under our contract, we are allowed to charge twenty five hundred per teacher, and we work with a minimum I of see. two teachers. So it's a five thousand dollar minimum fee to the school, and it includes everything that we give them, the yeah. course, the consulting 60 times a year, all of the materials that we either bring in and leave or bring in, use, and then right. return. What Sandy was talking about is that then we right. are, it's you incumbent on us out. to raise the like rest. Like all not-for-profits, exactly. the struggle we to get the, the money. We raise the rest of money. Yeah. Our commitment is to keeping the fees right. low to the school so that we can bring yeah. this kind of It must be very out. frustrating. Yeah when you read the reading levels of the, the children in school, or when you listen, I mean, I have friends now that are teaching in college or in business when they get memos that nobody knows how to spell. They don't know how to write. This must drive you crazy. Well, we, try, <laughs> we, we do have a specific handwriting method, too. We teach according to the face of a clock. So if the kids You're are making the letter A, they start at 2 in the clock and go around to 10 and down and close it up at 2 and a straight line down and say, ah. And now this is using all the senses, but you're also learning to write accurately. And that helps. You've got to be able to read is your this own considered, writing. Is this considered old-fashioned? It's probably old-fashioned. Or is old it fashioned. very modern? It's so old-fashioned, <laughs> it's modern. And the sure. truth is, honestly, the three of us believe devoutly, we could rescue American education. We really could. But it's the teachers who are so thrilled with this knowledge. And what we have found, sometimes our bilingual classes outperform the regular classes because uh, it, it makes such logic. And for example, Spanish-speaking children, who has the Latin roots more at his disposal. Mm. So when I do something on the Middle Ages, used to do something on the Middle Ages, I would bring in pictures of knights in armor and so on, and I would bring in facsimiles of um, beautiful illuminated manuscripts, one of which is right on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art right now, Les Très Riches Heures de the Duc de Berry. Yeah. And I would bring that oh, in I'd to show those. the kids. Yeah. And then we'd <laughs> write the word manuscript. Man, you, yeah. script. So it's, and I would say to the kids, because I do not speak Spanish. A man is writing to you? Is that what, what, is what I the, would get from it? What's the word for hand in Spanish? Mono. And it's mono. And what's the word for writing in Spanish? And it's scriberi. So the kids were telling me, so a manuscript is that which is written by hand. You can do this in first grade. And the kids adore it. But the teachers are being given tools that they have yearned for. So, so, so how do you go? I mean, what do you do? Do you go to conferences and preach this? Do you go down to the Department of Education? Do you go down to Washington? and see our new Secretary of Education. Come on, how are we going to do this, and enlarge it? If we, we can save our cu whole culture and civilization, it's let's mostly go. virtue. It's mostly <laughs> virtue. We used to run conferences, and, and five to 700 teachers would come to them, but we really can't afford it anymore, so we stopped. But they adored it. And um, we, we just really kind of tend our own garden. But right. you're right. I have asked. Um, one of our uh, representatives, Nita Lowy, to come and observe. I really wanted it. She's on the Congressional right. ed Education Committee. I really wanted to see this. And we do have people coming and observing. But mostly we're so busy raising money and doing our job. But you're right, it could save America. So there's no education. longer a reading foundation. There's no longer a national, national thing, reading. but there is Reading Reform Foundation of New York, alive and very well. And are there other 
uh, cities that have similar local groups? No, but there are many organ. There are Orton Dyslexia, uh, uh -huh. formerly Orton Dyslexia Society, now International Dyslexia Association. They have groups all over the country. They were where we were all trained first. Right. So we owe so, them so, a debt. So. But uh, I have to stress that uh, this is really for children of all economic levels. And the children in private school often don't get this. And children in privileged suburbs don't get this. And it gets rescued by private tutoring very mm -hmm. often. And uh, I would like to read a quote, if sure. I might, by a wonderful woman, now not uh, dead. She was a researcher up at Harvard University School of Education. Her name was Jean Schall, C-H-A-L-L. -L, and she was an extraordinary woman who first published a book in 76 called Reading the Great Debate. And from then on, she was hounded because of her point of view, which is, of course, ours. <laughs> and she, in her last book called The Reading Crisis, Why Poor Children Fall Behind, said, the needs of low-income children are not essentially different from those children of middle-class homes. Indeed, our findings suggest that low-income children benefit most from programs that work best for all children. A combination of structure, challenging and direct teaching, and practice in the reading of many books on a wide variety of, to of topics. And our belief is that this is the birthright of every child, an intellectual and engaging education. Well, how can we top that? Uh, you're not, you don't go into charter schools. Uh, we do not because they have so much financial support. And we really are intent on helping the regular public schools. And by the way, that is something that is not examined by the newspapers of New York City. There are many wonderful public schools in low-income areas. Yes. They're beautiful. They're well kept, and they're, they're painted beautifully. Faculties they've got a, a principal who's a great leader, and leads his or her faculty. And this is not shown. Do you have you have found teachers in community centers or in the, you know, where after school things or neighborhood community groups? Have you gone? Do you help anything with teaching literacy? I mean. Well, they come to our courses. They the teachers come to our courses. So those teachers, we don't keep track of everybody who comes. But uh, many of those people come from after-school organizations, community organizations, That's even pre-K centers, and they take the course. They don't get the in-school instruction that we offer, mm -hmm. but they take the courses. Many of our teachers who are in the public schools who have participated in our program then go out and do this in other places as well. So it could be a public school teacher who goes to the community center, who goes to the after school centers. Could go to a prison and help there. Yes. With yes. All, and all the different local, I mean, we're now more and more emphasizing community support to all different kinds of groups. And this That's seems right. to me to be a very important one. I was actually thinking the other day, $30 million they're going to spend to make 34th Street a pedestrian mall between 5th and 6th. And I was thinking to myself, why can't they re do these little learning centers in different Reading places about how to read? It's from the capital budget, so you have to build something. But we could build you a learning center in a couple of neighborhoods, and Wonderful. we would enrich I, the community, it. right? It's, a, it's an amazing kind of thing. And I, I still can't get over the fact that in this day and age, we have it, what, the whole education system phases me. I, I mean, I just uh, have great difficulty. But we haven't established that there is a best way to teach some basic skills. I don't understand that. Anybody have I anything think, well, to say? The, the thing that I was <laughs> really going to say is that of all the choices, given that there are limited resources, yeah. that the choice that we've made and our board has made over the years is that the early grades is where prevention Absolutely can take place. And if we have to marshal resources, yeah. that we should oh, marshal absolutely. them there. Because I've worked in prisons. Yeah. I know what that's yeah. 
like to see someone who clearly has not been available. I'm not available. suggesting that you guys do that. I'm right. suggesting, though, that other people I, look at I you and take these applications and this and theory. And I think that's and absolutely it. the case. Yeah. But I think often, if you were going to make a choice, yeah. that in the public school day, absolutely. in the early part of the day, in the heart of the day, is when you can really get this kind of material into the children. And then it can be reiterated in other Mm -hmm. parts of their day, other vocabulary can be brought in, it really can be integrated. Do parents come to your... Do they you call us. They don't come to us. We give out a, a bookmark, I think I gave you one, yeah. um, at, at, at Christmas time, and sometimes parents call and ask for advice and help, and they're very knowledgeable. They are, they know a lot more than people give well, them credit for. I'm very pleased to hear that because it's so important to have that parental support and pushing, right? The, um, I do want to say we have one offshoot that uh, 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 the director of the Jewish Community Center of, of Manhattan, they have a huge after-school program. They're in, I don't know how many, a dozen public schools, and that director took the co course with Esther, and has her program is very uh, aligned with ours. Yeah. Esther, do you, um, do you read very quickly? Yes, I used to even read even quicker when I was younger. <laughs> and do you read? Uh, I think that reading quickly is the art of judicious skipping. Yeah. But I think you first have to learn to read accurately. Right. Good That's point. Right. <laughs> and Lauren, I I don't know. I'm. Uh, Are you all good readers? Though? I, th I think I voracious. And readers. I was a phonics. I uh, learned phonics. I took Latin. I knew all the roots, and I found. That really made a huge difference yeah. always in we my life. We didn't even mention the word phonics, and we've come to the end of the program. Oh, my. So <laughs> my just children one thing, have phonics. Seen. My own children needed it. Yeah. And they are today uh, successful adults, but they couldn't have learned to read without it. Phonics. And it's a phonetic the instruction without is, this. is the basis. Yes. Well, Multisensory. Multisensory yes. phonetic yeah. instruction. Well, thank you very much, all thank of you, for you. coming. Thank you. And uh, we're, we, the website is on the screen, and people for more interest can go to the website, or they can call you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Reading you. Reform NY. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. Thank you. It was a delight. So quickly. It's yeah. really quick. Yeah. You're very good. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.